Productions. It's now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My, my question uh, to the Premier on um, the motion that we've tabled with the uh, Chair. I do want to say, in the, in the light of uh, the Premier's uh, position on Bill 74, uh, that's a I've been in politics for a long time. I've seen people take two sides of an issue. I've never in my life seen somebody take three sides of an issue. And that's not leadership we need in the province. And it's, it's just further evidence, Speaker, that we desperately need change in our province. And when we see the cancellation of the Oakville gas plant of $1.1 billion to put for the interests of the Liberal Party ahead of taxpayers, we've seen 10 months of indecision. We've seen 36 panels. Uh, I, I just got to ask a question. question. In light of the, the lack of decisions, except to save Liberal seats, why should we trust you to run the province of Ontario for even a single Thank you. More day? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Before I call the Premier, I'm going to make mention of the fact that I'm hearing something you know I don't like to hear, and, and you will be reminded for all of you. You mention uh, people by their riding or by their title, and I will not tolerate anything else. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday I had the privilege of being at Centennial College and being part of an announcement uh, about an investment into a program that is going to allow young people to get experience in the aerospace industry, Mr. Speaker, which is an absolutely leading and important industry in this province, Mr. Speaker. In fact, 14 of 25 um, manufacturers, Mr. Speaker, in the aerospace industry, uh, 14 of 25 in the world, are here, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario. So that investment in a facility at Downsview Park is going to play to our strengths as a province. I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the opposition would have been supportive of that kind of job creator, that kind of investment in people and infrastructure Answer. that is going to help the economy, is going to help people get into the economy, is going to create jobs. I would have thought that he would have been supportive of that, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Premier, I just want to see a government that's not corrupt. I want to see a government that's not morally bankrupt. That's, that's what I want. I, I'm, also, I'm just going to caution, so let's stay away from the kind of language that could be inflammatory, and I would uh, ask the member to, to uh, follow that request. The, um, you know, the Premier continues to put the interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the interests of hardworking taxpayers. Uh, we put a motion on the floor of the House to say that we simply cannot trust the Liberals to run the province of Ontario. Uh, clearly, that's what I hear from Ontarians around this province. We're losing jobs. We're losing more manufacturing jobs in Hamilton. We have folks Porter. at the racetrack who are facing closure. And quite frankly, despite the NDP protests, that track would not be closing without the support of the NDP. The Liberals over and over and over again. So the question is, if the NDP actually suddenly agrees with us instead of siding with the Liberals in each and every vote, if they say they're on the side of Ontario families and agree with us that we can't trust a Liberal government instead of being patsies for the Liberals, will you then say, let's go to the people, Thank let's you. actually let them decide we can forge forward to better Ontario? Mr. Speaker. What we want to do on this side of the House is give people the opportunity to get the training that they need, make sure that communities have the infrastructure that they need, Mr. Speaker, so that we can continue to bring business to the province. We want an economy that's going to thrive, and we have a plan, Mr. Speaker, to make those investments, and we are executing that plan, Mr. Speaker. What we are not going to do is make a 180-degree turn and cancel the services that people need, fire workers, Mr. Speaker, close hospitals, Close schools. We have done that, Mr. Speaker. So the reality. Is the Minister of Rural Affairs come to order. The member from Neopee and Carleton come to order. The member from Lanth and Kent Middlesex come to order. And I'll catch the rest of you in the next time around. Policies, Mr. Speaker, that we are putting in place, including those around the horse racing industry. And I know that the leader of the third party has a newfound interest in horse racing at Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that the public policy that was in place as a result of their government was not yes, transparent. Sir. It was not accountable, Mr. Speaker. It had to be changed. We have changed it. And my hope is that the racetracks Thank across you. the province will have a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, the um, frankly, the premier caused a crisis, and she signed the document that sold the province yep. down the river to the tune of 1.1 billion dollars. Yep. Uh, and quite frankly, the NDP sold their soul to prop you up. Here's the reality across the province: hydro rates have doubled. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. People are worried about keeping their job, let alone the pay raise that they need in this province in the private sector. The horse racing industry is in jeopardy. The reality is, to get anything done, you need two parties in our legislature to support that agenda. So far, the Liberals and the NDP have been hand in glove driving for this agenda that's resulted in doubling hydro rates, the closure potentially of racetracks across the province. The NDP changes their mind and says, you know what? We're actually saying enough is enough. We can't trust this Liberal government. If they support our motion, will that mean you'll actually put the vote for the people of Ontario to decide to move forward? Mr. Speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to pick up on something that the uh, leader of the opposition said. And you know, I acknowledge that we are in fragile economic times. You look around jurisdictions around the world, Mr. Speaker. We are in fragile economic times. So I do not believe that firing 10,000 education workers and 2,000 health care workers and putting in place right-to-work legislation, Mr. Speaker, that would drive down uh, work rate, workplace to the co lowest common denominator and, in fact, kill jobs. Mr. Speaker, that is not the route that I believe is responsible, Mr. Speaker. So we're not going to take that route. That is the route that is laid out by the leader of the opposition. So we believe that the investments in people and in infrastructure and in a business climate that will bring business to the province is where we should go, Mr. Speaker. Which is what the announcement yesterday was about. Answer. The aerospace industry is one of our strengths. That's the kind of strategic investment that needs to be made in order for this economy to thrive. We're going to continue on that path. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated. And I'm actually telling everybody to stop heckling. New question. The member. Speaker. My question, as well, is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier has no mandate from the people of Ontario. She is providing over the largest political scandal in Ontario's history, and a new opinion poll says Ontarians want an election over the gas plant scandal. It says somebody should be thrown in jail over this $1.1 billion scandal. And I believe those results, Speaker, because when I'm in Osgoode or Coors or North Gore or Nepean, the same people that are being asked in these polls are telling the same thing to me. They think they ought to be thrown in jail. Voters have lost confidence in this Liberal Party. It seems the only person with any confidence in this Liberal Party is the leader of the New Democrats, who, by the way, sat idly while that party canceled its slots at the racetrack program in Fort Erie and in Rideau Carlton. And my question is, if this legislature adopts our opposition motion next Wednesday that says that Thank you. voters have lost trust in your party, will you Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's a little bit much that uh, the Leader of the Opposition and the members of the Progressive Conservative Party have stood up and made all this noise about wanting to clear the decks and get on with the legislation involving employment, involving creating jobs for Ontarians. Right now, we have Bill 105 in front of the Legislature, Mr. Speaker, and instead of finishing the debate on 105 order. and allowing it to proceed to the next stage, Leach they're engaging Greenville, come to order. in all, all sorts of uh, efforts to delay. They're bringing forward uh, these mischievous motions. Mr. Speaker, Calvin, the Honourable come to Member order. knows that under the standing orders of this legislature, Hastings, that this, is, this is simply a stunt by the opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's time that the opposition starts to focus on jobs for the province of Ontario. Let Bill 105, which lowers taxes for small business, Thank go you. through and stop focus. Thank you. Supplementary. I'd like to go back to the Premier of Ontario because this relates directly to the confidence and the trust the people of this province have in her. The forum research poll was quite clear. People don't view them as a trusted government. They view them as a bunch of criminals. Minister of Transportation, why, why come to order. That this, this goes to a vote. Attorney General, come to order. It's important that this motion be listened to. 
This is a premier who would prefer to set up panels across the province so that everyone in the province is on one so she can feel that she's having a conversation. But what we learn in those conversations, particularly at the Justice Committee, Speaker, is that their government is at the very root of a very corrupt scheme in Oakville and Mississauga. And uh, stop the clock for a moment, please. I'm trying to do my job so I don't need armchair quarterbacks, and I hear what the member said, and I'm not impressed again. We will stay away from any references to any member in this place as involved in criminality, and I'm asking the member to uh, stay away from that. Carry on. Thanks. Now that the Liberals are ignoring Ontarians and their wishes, and the NDP continues to prop them up, I'd like to know what she has Question. promised the NDP in order to prop them up. And next Wednesday, when our when our party puts forward our motion, I'd really like to know, Thank Premier, you. if you are. Going to listen Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. You know. Mr. Speaker, they can't have it both ways. They can't stand here in the House and say over and over again that the cancellation of the power plants was the worst thing to befall civilization since the plague or the Macarena, and forget the fact that they stood up, Mr. Speaker, they stood up in the campaign aggressively and said, vote for us and the power plants will be cancelled, that their candidates had robocalls and flyers and tweets, that they went door to door saying, vote for a progressive conservative government and the plants will be cancelled. Mr. Speaker, it was a promise they made and a promise we kept. It was a promise that was made by every single party in this legislature, and the honourable member cannot deny that fact. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Order. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier of Ontario. Mr. Transportation and Ontarians Infrastructure, come to order. On to the opposition's questions over a very important matter of trust and confidence. She has lost their confidence and never was able to get it in the first place because she has no mandate from the electorate. Not only will I debunk what this government House Leader has said with respect to the Oakville gas plants, I have the words from the Auditor General, as does the, the rest of the people of this province. You are behind that Oakville ca uh, power plant cancellation. You cost the taxpayers of this province $1.1 billion. And I want to know, from the Premier's own mouth, will she listen to our confidence motion next week? Will she tell the people of the province that she, does, she will listen to them when they don't trust her? Premier, yes or no, will you have the courage of your conviction to stand in this place and tell us you'll respect the vote of this House next week or not? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Government House Leader? You know, first of all, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's not a cop. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, second time. <coughs> Carry on. Mr. Speaker, first of all, it's not a, a confidence motion. The member knows that. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I direct the member to go to the website of Mayor Rob Burton of Oakville. He has a section called Timeline related to this. And let me quote, you'll want to hear this. On September 25, 2011, this is what I, I'm quoting, PC leader Tim Hudak says the Oakville power member plant from cancellation, cancellation costs $1 billion and suggests because you were yelling so loud, you didn't hear me, even with my mic on. The member from Stormont will come to order. Carry on. And suggests the Mississauga power plant cancellation may cost another billion. On October 5, 2011, on the day before Minister the provincial Rural election, Affairs come to in order. front of the still under construction Mississauga power plant, PC leader Tim Hudak promises to stop the power plant if he wins the election after only days before warning that he's sure it may cost another billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. That is the testimony of Mayor Rob Burton of Oakville, and I invite the uh, honourable member to check out that Thank website. You. New question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today we're joined in the Legislature by four horse families from Fort Erie. They're wondering why the Premier is killing racing in their community and whether it's just so that the Liberals can help up. Order. Order.
And if it continues, uh, I might jump right to warnings. We will have civility here. Finish your question, please. And whether it's just so the Liberals can help out the newly privatized Woodbine track, pad their profit map margins, the kind of track that the Tories pre pre prefer as well, Speaker. Is the Premier ready to meet the member from Huron Bruce's warrant today and explain to them why she thinks the Fort Erie track should not have a future of racing Thank you. Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I welcome the folks from Fort Erie here today, and I would just say that the leader of the third party is absolutely wrong. I want there to be a future for the horse uh, racing at uh, Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I want us to have a, a robust and sustainable horse racing industry across the province. That is not what we had in place, Mr. Speaker. There was an unaccountable. Uh, uh, untransparent system in place, Mr. Speaker. It had to be changed. When I came into this office, I said that I was going to make sure that we had an integrated system with the OLG so that uh, horse racing across this province would have a future, because I believe that it is an important part of our culture. It's an important part of uh, the culture in rural communities around the province, Mr. Speaker, and it's important to the Answer. province. So, I want Fort Erie to have a future. It may not be exactly the same as its past, but I want it to have a future, and the plan we've got in place will allow for Thank that, you. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Liberals are gambling on the future of horse racing, and the Premier should know that the stakes are real. Henry and Claudia Whelan are here today. They've had to meet with the bank about how they can keep their home, and the stress has caused Henry to have a heart attack. The government is pulling the rug out from under them, but still trying to roll out the red carpet for private casinos, even while community after community rejects those private casinos. The Premier's admitted that the government's so-called modernization plan was a mistake. Will she let families like the Whalens pay for that mistake, Speaker, or will she back away from a plan that just is not working? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I said, I have been clear from the outset that there is a future for Fort Erie. The, the reality is that the track will need to work with the Ontario Racing Commission, as the other tracks will need to, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that there is a plan in place. The member from Ru the Minister of Rural Affairs is warned. Carry on. Putting $400 million into horse racing over the next five years, Mr. Speaker, and each one of the tracks around the province has the opportunity to work with the Ontario Racing Commission to make the case for a business plan. That is the responsible way forward, Mr. Speaker. We want a horse racing industry that is sustainable and for which the success is tied to the usage by people who go to the track. We want that to be. We want that to be the benchmark. There was no benchmark under the uh, slide. Program, Mr. Speaker, there was no benchmark. There was no transparency. Thank we you. need that transparency. That's. Thank you. Final supplementary. Twelve-year-old uh, Kayla is with us today, too, Speaker. Her dad and her brother have had to move to Florida to find work. Kayla grew up on a farm, and horses have been part of her life since she can remember. But instead of working with families like Kayla's, the premier has taken away their livelihood and her livelihood. Kayla asked to put this question to the Premier, and so I'm going to do it. What does the Premier think is going to happen to the horses that have been raised and trained by families like hers when there's nowhere to race those horses and those families can't afford to keep them anymore? So I want, I'm not sure where Kayla is, but I want Kayla to know that the tracks that I have visited, the horse families that I have, the racing families that I have spoken to, the people I've spoken to at the in the horse racing industry are exactly they are the they are the reason that I was so committed when I came into this job that we would put a plan in place that would allow the tracks like Fort Erie to work with the Ontario Racing Commission. So I Carter. want Fort Erie to have a future. I want horse racing to have a future. It was one of my priorities. It's one of the reasons I took on the role as Minister of Agriculture and Food. So I want the people in this in this gallery to know that there is an opportunity for Fort Erie Order. to work with the Ontario Racing Commission and to put in place a sustainable plan for the future. Answer. That is why we wanted to bring the plan out early so that people who were breeding horses would know that the plan was in Thank place. You. $400 million over the Thank you. Seated, please.
Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Speaker, the Premier said that she uh, killed racing at Fort Erie because uh, this Lots at Racetrack program wasn't affordable or transparent. She just said that earlier this morning. Jim T. Baird, the CEO of Fort Erie Racetrack, is here with us today. Jim made sure that the track at Fort Erie opened their books to auditors and to the public. Will the Premier ensure that the newly private Woodbine Racetrack has to open its books to, uh, so Ontarians have the same level of accountability and transparency, transparency for that track, Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker, absolutely. And I think what the leader of the third party is alluding to is the reality that as we went into the transition, Mr. Speaker, there were audits that were done of each of the tracks in the province, and those audits contained commercially sensitive information, Mr. Speaker, and so they were confidential. And that was the agreement with the tracks, Mr. Speaker. There is currently a, 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 an audit being done by the Auditor General of the Slots at Racetrack program, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, when that report comes out, that report will be be public and will be available to all members of the legislature and the public, Mr. Speaker. But make no mistake, we needed to make a change to the program that Answer. had been put in place that was unaccountable, that had been put in place by the previous government. We're making that change, but we're making it in a way that horse racing must have a sustainable future, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the government did conduct an audit of racetracks to see how SART money was being spent, and Jim D. T. Bear and the folks from Fort Erie gladly opened up their books. But the Premier is keeping the Woodbine audit under under wraps. It's, she is not making that information public because it's commercially sensitive. Speaker, sounds like the gas plants to me. Yeah. That's why we didn't let that information come out because it was commercially sensitive. And look where that landed, Ontario. She says she wants to be accountable and open. In fact, she's got a panel to tell her how exactly to do that. Do I need to be a member of that panel, Speaker, to suggest that she release the Woodbine audit? <laughs> Well, if you'd like to be part of that panel, you may be part of that panel, Mr. Speaker. Um, but I, the reality is, as I have said, in order to work with tracks to go through a transition so that we could redesign a program that would be sustainable, there were audits that were done of each of the tracks, Mr. Speaker. Those were done confidentially. That was the agreement with the tracks, Mr. Speaker. And the, there is commercially sensitive information as part of those audits. There is currently an audit that's being done by the Auditor General, and that report will be made public, Mr. Speaker. If there had been misconduct discovered, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the third party audit, Audits, then that would have been sent to the authorities. That did not happen, Mr. Speaker. Going forward, Answer. we have put a sustainable plan in place. And I think it's interesting to note, Mr. Speaker, that I have heard absolutely no strategy from the third party on Thank how you. they would make horse racing sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Gee, uh, gee, Speaker, I, I think what the Premier is saying is just trust us. Everything in those audits is on the tickety boo. I don't think the people of Ontario buy that from the Liberal government. Here, Speaker. You know, when people go to the track, they expect a fair race. Not for profit tracks like Fort Erie have opened up their books. Minister the of Immigration and Citizenship, uh, come to order. Woodbine will do the same. The government has put the livelihoods of the people here today and rural communities across Ontario at risk. At the very least, she should be giving them the openness and the transparency that she likes to harp about but rarely delivers. When will she open the books? So, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as I, as I said, there has been no plan coming forward from the third party on how they would make horse racing in this province sustainable, Mr. Speaker. The suggestion that underlies the, the leader of the third party's question is that somehow everything was fine under the previous regime, that the slots at racetrack program was fine, that it was good public policy. That's just not the case, Mr. Exactly. Speaker, and Fort Erie was struggling under that plan as well, Mr. Speaker. So, the reality the reality is we have worked very hard with all of the tracks in the province, Mr. Speaker, to put in place a plan that's going to allow them to have a future. My hope is that the people at Fort Erie will work with the Ontario Racing Commission. I want Fort Erie to have a future, Mr. Speaker, not because that's the politically expedient thing to do, Mr. Speaker, but because people's jobs rely on it and because horse racing is an important part of our culture. That's why we're putting the plan in place, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please.
New question. Member from Whitby, Oshawa. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister Kim Fletcher, a Milton mother with two young children, is asking for more time. More time with her nine-year-old son and seven-year-old daughter. After being diagnosed with stage four terminal glioblastoma multiform, she's been told that she has only two months to live. Kim's doctors have told her that Avastin will give her more time, in fact, up to 18 months more time. Minister, you and your ministry have denied funding for Avastin for uses other than for colorectal cancer. But in fact, studies show that the use of Avastin with both colorectal cancer and brain cancer is the same. It gives patients more time. If Ms. Fletcher lived in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, or Manitoba, Avastin would be covered. Will you commit today to give Kim Fletcher more time and commit to funding Avastin for her care? Thank you, Minister of Health and Care. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And this is a very heartbreaking story. I have, uh, I have followed um, this particular patient. Uh, I've been on the website. I've seen the pictures of. Uh, of uh, Kim Fletcher and her husband are two gorgeous little children. I cannot help but imagine if this were my own children. Speaker, um, it is a heartbreaking story. We have passed a law in this legislature that takes the politics out of drug funding. It, it would be against the law for me to intervene in a particular case for a particular drug. We do have in place a committee to evaluate drugs. It has twice reviewed the evidence uh, on uh, uh, using Avastin for this particular condition, Answer. and twice it has rejected that for lack of evidence. Thank you. Supplementary. I would respectfully disagree with the minister. There are several programs under which there are there is an ability to fund drugs for compassionate purposes under the exceptional access program or the case by case review program under Ca Cancer Care Ontario. And surely you have to agree that Kim Fletcher's case is one of those cases where compassion should be administered. In fact, this is why we pay taxes in the province exactly. of Ontario. Unlike want their tax money to be used for their fellow Ontarians in their time of need. Yeah. Minister Kim Fletcher and her husband are here with us today. Will you do the right thing and extend compassion to this family and extend a basket for her care? Thank you. Thank you. You see any place? You see any place? You see any place? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, this is a family going through an absolutely heartbreaking um, um, event in their life. All of us want nothing but the very, very best uh, for this family and for this individual. Uh, I do have the Committee to Evaluate Drugs report. These reports are publicly available on the website. Um, as I say, it has been reviewed twice for this condition in July of 2010 and June of 2011. Uh, the recommendation is that it not be funded for, this treatment, for the treatment of this disease on the basis that treatment has not been proven to improve survival. Speaker, I will happily pass this over. The Committee to Evaluate Drugs will always review new evidence. As a result of their work, Speaker, we've added 300, uh, Answer. Uh, 300 new drugs to the formulary. Uh, speaker, they do hard work. These are very difficult decisions. These are not political Thank decisions. Thank you. Good question. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. 30 to 50 percent of operating costs for the mining sector is the price of electricity. And the threshold for the Global Adjustment Program still stands at one megawatt, which penalizes mis-sized producers. In Thunder Bay, the government doesn't even realize that the electricity supply is not sufficient to support new mining developments. Will the government commit to a real plan for mining development in Ontario by coming up with a plan to increase electricity supply and to deal with the sky-high price of electricity so that mining companies can create good jobs? Minister of Northern Development. 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, we have just received in the last uh, couple of days uh, the report back from the task force uh, for Northwestern Ontario, uh, based out of Thunder Bay. Uh, they're responding to a plan that's on the OPA website to really uh, invest uh, billions of dollars, literally, over the foreseeable future in Northwestern Ontario for hydro electric for electricity uh, and transmission. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, from the mining industry point of view, they will have power when they need it. We've given that commitment. We're talking to the people uh, from Northwest Ontario in particular on that particular issue. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we have introduced supports for energy prices in the north. Uh, we have the Northern Ontario Energy Credit, Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, uh, and a number of other programs, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir. We are going to deliver. We are delivering for Northwest Ontario. That includes Thunder Bay. And uh, I'm happy to Thank talk you. to the uh, uh, to the member uh, Thank personally. You. Supplementary. Thank you again. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Ontario's mining sector has created 27,500 direct jobs and tens of thousands of indirect jobs. The development of the Ring of Fire and numerous other projects in the Northwest will require a skilled workforce by 2020. Yet this program, that yet this government refuses to play a role in training programs. Mining companies can create jobs, but they need the right competitive factor, including a trained workforce. Why is this Liberal government not investing in a training program so that the people of Ontario can benefit from the immense economic opportunity that mining can create? Minister of Northern Development Mines. Sir, Northern That's Development Mines. I'm, I'm really pleased to respond to this, particularly in light of the fact that we have uh, invested so many significant millions of dollars, in fact, in, ter in terms of skills training and upgrading related to the uh, great potential of the Ring of Fire. We recognize there are many components to the uh, development of this, this plan. Clearly, our work with the First Nations, we've uh, recognized how important that is, and it's ongoing in a positive way. But as the member points out quite accurately, um, we, have, we, have, we have a mining sector in the province of Ontario that's employing more people than a as ever have. We are the leading jurisdiction for, for exploration and for production in our mining sector in all of Canada and one of the top 10 investment jurisdictions in the world. Certainly in terms of the training aspects, through a number of programs, through a number of investments, we are preparing the workforce in northwestern Ontario, in fact of all of Ontario, to be prepared and ready for when the Ring of Fire development moves forward. We're continuing to be committed Answer. to that. That's all one of the aspects that's so crucial, so we certainly agree and we're all in the same Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Research and Innovation, and it deals with the importance of supporting new, thriving companies. In my writing of uh, York Southwestern, my constituents strive for quality and well-paying jobs so that they can provide for their families. And they also want their children to have a good university or college education so that they can be ready to be the leaders of our future. Ontario's capacity to compete in the global knowledge-based economy depends on how well we can utilize our research strengths and provide the support our entrepreneurs and their businesses need to prosper. We need to ensure that Ontario benefits to the full extent from our knowledge-based economy because our future success and that of our children depends on Question. it. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how is our government helping new upcoming companies thrive and succeed? Thank you. Minister of thank Research you, and Speaker, Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from York Southwestern for that important question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of assisting new companies. Actually, my ministry has helped many new startup companies to compete in the global market. For example, we helped Client Outlook. This is a Waterloo-based company, software company, that allows hospitals to share digital x-rays and save some money instead of spending money on setting up uh, workstations. In Ancaster, Mr. Speaker, we helped a company called Fibercast, which harnesses its technology in purifying drinking water and treatment of wastewater technologies. Fibercast now 
employs 70 people in the region. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government's track record in helping small, innovative companies develop yes, products and services that are helping Ontario and also help uh, people's lives. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. The backbone of any strong economy starts with providing the necessary support that small and local companies need to thrive. Small companies across our great province provide the most jobs to Ontarians, and our ability to help them turn great ideas into successful businesses and new employment opportunities is of paramount importance to our economy. And when Ontarians have well-paying jobs to support their families, they can take comfort in knowing that future generations are well positioned to prosper and succeed. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister. Could you speak to the initiatives that our government is taking to help small, local and innovative businesses thrive? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank again the member from York Southwestern for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking strong action to ensure that Ontario companies remain globally competitive and have necessary tools to succeed. For example, Mr. Speaker, Bill 105, the Support Small Business Act, is one of the very many steps that our government is taking to help small businesses. This will aim to help small businesses in Ontario, but much of their detriment is being delayed in this House, Mr. Speaker. I urge the opposition to stop stalling the passing of Bill 105 so that we can move forward in helping small businesses in this province. When innovative businesses succeed in our province, Mr. Speaker, our local economies are going to succeed. Mr. Speaker, we can make this happen by letting this bill to proceed to the committee uh, in order to help our small yes, businesses across the province of Ontario. Thank you. Your question, the member from Burlington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker, through you to the Premier. Premier, yesterday U.S. Steel announced that the massive blast furnaces of the former Stelco plant in Hamilton will shut down permanently by year end. Terrible. It will be the end of an era in Canadian industrial history. At peak in the 1980s, more than 14,000 people earned a good living at Stelco. They built a proud city and helped make our economy strong. This spring, you insisted that the job crisis in Ontario's manufacturing sector was a myth. Do you still believe that today? Good question. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, of course, uh, we and the government are disappointed that U.S. Steel has made uh, this decision, unfortunately, to end uh, certain operations that have, in fact, been idle since 2010. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we understand Order. that Hamilton Works uh, coke making and finishing operations will continue to operate, and it's important to note as well that no immediate layoffs uh, will uh, or have occurred. And we understand, in fact, that the company plans to reassign the 47 uh, individual employees that are impacted by this uh, regrettable decision. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over 80% of Canada's steelmaking happens in this province. We're very proud of that. In fact, the sector employs uh, more than 17,000 people across the province, and in directly more than 50,000 more, but we will continue to work proactively with the entire sector to spur innovation and attract in investment in Thank you. jobs. The uh, member, before I call on the member from Burlington, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Supplementary, please. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I didn't get my answer. So anyway, I'll continue no on. Plan. Premier, across the bay from my riding, skilled no workers have been making steel for over a century. Your party has been in office for a decade. In that time, Ontario has lost 300,000 wow. manufacturing jobs. The manufacturing crisis is no myth, Premier. It is real. No Your government has a role to play, Premier, and that role is strong leadership. That's Could right. we have changed headlines with a plan that offered more affordable industrial power rates? Yes. What a tax deduction for investments in plant and equipment yeah, yeah. have Great. saved jobs. We believe it would and truly wish you would take our plan. Premier, if we have to wait until the 2014 budget to hear your jobs plan, will there be any manufacturing jobs left? Minister. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with the member opposite that the steel sector worldwide is facing challenges right now. And in fact, the economy, as we know, in this province is facing challenges. But it's important to remember, Mr. Speaker, that since the bottom of the recession, we have created almost five 
100,000 net new jobs, in fact, many of them in the manufacturing sector, 95 per cent of them full-time jobs, Mr. Speaker, and the overwhelming majority of them in the private sector as well. So the pace of job creation, when you compare it to other jurisdictions uh, around us, the pace of job creation in this province far exceeds that in the United States. In fact, uh, exceeds that substantially uh, among the, uh, our competitors in the Great Lake states as well. Uh, so we have a plan going Answer. forward. We're creating jobs. It includes in the steel industry, and we will work hard to make sure that those workers who are displaced have the support that Thank they you. need. Question the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, Steeltown got its name from the iron and steel works that defined Hamilton for more than a century. Yesterday, U.S. Steel announced the permanent shutdown of the iron and steel making operations. Since 2010, U.S. Steel has said they could restart their operations if the economy turned around. Speaker, in that time, New Democrats have proposed a job creator tax credit, getting sky high electricity rates under control, and an industrial investment tax credit, which could have helped to add a hot strip mill. Glad to see the Tories now actually accept our idea, Speaker. <laughs> here, here. The problem is the Liberals have stuck with the status quo. New Democrats believe that Hamilton can come out of this stronger, so why is this government Question. simply throwing up its hands? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, and as the, uh, the member, the, uh, the leader of the third party, uh, I know that she agrees with me in saying that I'm so proud of Hamilton and the work that they've been doing over the past years to actually reach the stage where they're the number one jurisdiction in all of Canada for investment and commercial and residential and industrial activity. There. So the work that is being done, the leadership that's being demonstrated by that city is nothing short of remarkable, Mr. Speaker. And I want to mention as well that we've been working closely with Hamilton Works for a number of years with U.S. Steel to support those workers who unfortunately have faced uh, layoffs in that uh, difficult sector of steel right now. And in fact, the colleague behind me, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, uh, since 2011 has supported an action centre with the Hamilton Answer. Steel workers to make sure that those laid off employees are getting the support that they need. We'll continue to do that. But I'm proud of the work that Hamilton's done. Thank you. I have no doubt they're going to be able to overcome Thank these. You. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Minister's facile boosterism isn't enough. The government can try and pass the buck, or they can stand up for Hamiltonians. Mayor Bertina said, and this is his words, his, quote, worst fears come true. The government is standing on the sidelines and watching as those fears come true. Speaker, they can waste a billion dollars on cancelling gas plants to save a few Liberal seats in the GTA but they won't fund a manufacturing investment tax credit that could help businesses across Ontario invest and grow. Hamilton is filled with smart, dedicated, hardworking people who can come out of this stronger. Is the Premier going to stop standing by and watching as Steeltown loses its steelmaking works, or will she start listening to Question. New Democrats and focus on job creation instead of her own political self-interest? Well, thank you, and Mr. Speaker. You know we are investing in Hamilton. We are supporting the leadership in, in Hamilton as they work their way through transitions, including uh, the likes of what we're hearing in the steel worker. But I want to say, Mr. Speaker, we are investing in manufacturing right across this province. In fact, we've committed nearly a billion dollars to support 170 projects in the province's manufacturing sector since 2007. And Mr. Speaker, we've been providing relief as well, tax relief to our manufacturers. Of course, we uh, parallel the federal government government earlier in the budget earlier this year to extend the uh, accelerated capital cost allowance uh, we uh, we and that is a value that is a value of nearly a quarter of a billion dollars over the next uh, several years and of course through the southwestern ontario development fund and other mechanisms we're investing in the manufacturing and other sectors throughout that that region of ontario and we're proud to work with the local leadership to do that thank you your question the member from thunder bay out of Colton. speaker thank you very much my uh, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines and has to do with the uh, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. The Minister, one of the uh, chronic constant complaints we hear as Northerners from our political opponents is that Northern Ontario doesn't have a voice and that their voice is not heard. Now, obviously, as a Northerner, I, I emphatically uh, reject that premise. Um, our investments through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and our increases in funding, and it's important to note, taking that fund from $60 million 
to $100 million annually is just one very clear indication that, in fact, the North is being heard and that Northern members continue to deliver for their ridings. Now, I know very recently, Minister, you made an announcement on a bit of a renew, relook, refresh of the programming within the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, and I'm wondering, Minister, if you could share with the House exactly what Question. that programming is going to do to continue that wonderful trend in Northern Ontario. Thank you, Minister thank, Northern thank you so much to the members Lawrence. on the Beatitude, and we're, we're so very proud of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation in terms of the jobs that it has created, 22,000 jobs uh, created or retained over the last uh, uh, ten years, uh, you know, thousands of brought $890 million in investment. But two weeks ago, we, we decided we needed to look and say, can we make this can we make the program even stronger? And we had the opportunity to announce five new programs to, uh, to basically uh, uh, enhance the how the heritage fund works and what we recognize while we want to tie it into the priorities that were identified in the northern ontario growth plan existing and emerging sectors in the economy the ones that we are the real priorities for the north so now what we've done is with the new programs the northern ontario heritage fund corporation has aligned programs with those sectors uh, that will maximize maximize benefit for northerners and even work better than it has in the past so uh, we've been working with northern municipalities Aboriginal communities, certainly industry and in private sector, to create a stronger, more diverse, and sustainable northern economy. And I'll look forward in my supplementary to Brad provide. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to ask the minister next time. Wait for me to acknowledge you before we start. Your microphone won't be on. Carry on. Supplementary. Thank you very much, and minister. Thank you uh, for that response. As mentioned, since 2003, October 2003 over $860 million towards more than 5,800 projects, leveraging over $3 billion in investment. I can tell you in my riding alone, there's been tens of millions of uh, dollars of investment through hundreds of projects, creating or maintaining close to 1,700 jobs. Now, a few examples in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan. New Tech Net Metals, $300,000 to expand a fab shop for a high-definition plasma table, allowing them to bid on jobs they previously couldn't hire more people. Ruben Business Park in Murillo and at Oliver Papoonge, over $500,000 for an expansion of their industrial park with service lots. Thank Thunder you. Bay International Airport Authority, the third busiest airport in all of Ontario, a million dollars to continue the great trend that we see there on the business expansion at Thunder Bay International Airport. So, so Minister, can you please share with the House the new programming specifically, how we're going to see that continue what's been a great trend through NOHFC all across Northern Thank Ontario. You. Sir, so much again, and, and this is why aligning uh, the, our programs with the growth plan is, is so important because the growth plan calls on us to strengthen Ontario, no, the North's competitive advantage. So our program changes are focusing investment on existing and emerging sectors that have uh, uh, strong potential for significant growth across the North. And as part of our government's plan to strengthen the economy and support a dynamic and an innovative business climate that attracts investment and helps create jobs, uh, the NOHFC can to continue to partner with Northerners. So the five new programs at the Heritage Fund are built on the themes of private sector job creation, supporting Northern community infrastructure, enhancing economic development capacity, Answer. stimulating commercialization, innovation and productivity, and of course attracting and retaining talent. But we look forward to continuing to work with all of our Northern Thank organizations you. to keep building jobs, creating Thank jobs you. in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, a member from Lacton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. As you are aware, Premier, your government has managed to pass just four pieces of legislation since your Liberal coronation. Of course, my Bill 74, which you flipped and flopped by first supporting and then opposing and then just outright hiding, was defeated yesterday. Premier, you demonstrated cowardly, weak leadership. Yeah. This morning, though, a I'm, uh, I'm not going to accept that. It's not uh, what I would call elevating the debate, so the member will withdraw. I withdraw. Premier, you demonstrated weak leadership. This morning, I'd like to ask you about Bill 69, the Prompt Payment Act. Bill 69 is an important bill that has broad support from all three parties in this House. Prompt payment is also supported by industry stakeholders, such as the Council of Ontario Construction Association and the Ontario Road Builders Association. Premier, is Bill 69 a priority for your Liberal government, and if so, when do you expect to move forward Question. on this important piece of legislation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Vaughan for his uh, efforts in this area. 
I realize there interest, there's interest in this piece of legislation on both sides of the House, Mr. Speaker. The bill will move through the normal course of, uh, of the process in the legislature. There'll be an opportunity for debate and a vote. And uh, I'm focused, Mr. Speaker. I'm focused on making sure that we make the investments in people and in infrastructure and in uh, a business climate that's going to bring going to bring business to this province and is going to uh, work with the private sector to create jobs, Mr. Speaker. This piece of legislation will have its uh, it will have its day in the House, and I look forward to the debate. Do supplementary. Premier, enough of the song and dance. You're delaying this legislation. Yeah. The construction industry employs over 400,000 men and women, approximately 6.5% of Ontario's total workforce. Prompt payment legislation will correct the existing inequity so that small and medium-sized construction firms have the ability to invest, grow, and create jobs. Premier, prompt payment legislation already exists around the world. Uh, in the majority of U.S. states, the U.K., the EU, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. One month, ago, one month ago, Premier, I questioned you about this important piece of legislation, and last week I wrote to your office urging you to move forward with Bill 69. Premier, it's obvious that you have no desire to move forward on prompt payment legislation. Yeah. Have you told your MPP from Vaughan that his Bill 69 Question? isn't going anywhere in your Liberal government? You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member is being a little mischievous. He understands more than anyone that this is a private member's bill. It is right now before committee. There will be an opportunity for uh, discussion at committee, and he knows that private members' bills, there is a tradition that their movement to third reading, when it does happen, happens after discussion between the parties and as a result of uh, agreements. His particular one came forward due to uh, a programming motion that was put forward. There are others that have come uh, between a consensus between the House leaders. He knows that's the process to follow. But you know, Mr. Speaker, if he wants to talk about support for small businesses, Maybe he wants to stand up and explain why the Conservative Party is filibustering Bill 105, which would cut taxes for small business and not allow yes, it to proceed to committee so that it can help the, have the positive economic effects we know Thank that it you. will bring. New question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, yesterday Londoners learned that your ministry is cutting cataract surgeries to save money. In London, the wait time for cataract surgery is nearly 200 days and rising, which, as we know, affects seniors the most. This government didn't listen to the eye physicians and surgeons of Ontario when they said that these cuts will, and I quote, have dire consequences for patients requiring cataract surgery. Why is this Liberal government cutting back cataract surgeries for seniors who need it to be able to see? Thank you, Minister of Health, and Care. Well, Speaker, when it comes to cataract surgery, this government has a friendly, remarkable yeah. a record. Question. Speaker, across the province, wait times for cataract surgeries have been cut in half. Uh, as of August 2013, 93% of cataract surgeries were being completed within our target. Speaker, uh, province-wide, and I'll need my glasses for this. Speaker, uh, province-wide. We've cut 163 days off cataract surgery. We more than cut in half the uh, wait times. At Southwest, you might remember this, the member opposite might remember this. At St. Joe's Healthcare, when we started measuring cataract surgeries, it was 495 days, a year and a half. Speaker, we have reduced that by 60 percent, and we are um, almost at the target. Speaker, we have a great success story. I would love to talk about more about in the Thank supplementary. You. Yeah. supplementary. Speaker, I appreciate the minister's response. However, Shirley Hazelwood is 77 years old and lives in my riding of London West. She is on a wait list and won't have cataract surgery until September of 2014. That's a wait time of almost one year, more than double the target this government promised. Shirley can no longer read or watch TV and is now considering going to the U.S. to have surgery. Speaker, Shirley and seniors in this province need cataract surgery to be able to see. They shouldn't have to leave the country to get their vision corrected. Is this Liberal government trying to make up the $1.1 billion wasted on the gas plant scandal by forcing seniors with cataracts to wait longer as their eyesight Question. deteriorates? 
Minister. Uh, speaker, I think it's important to acknowledge that ours was the government that started to measure wait times. Yeah. Ours, the, it, uh, we are the government that publicly reports wait times. Yeah. We are the government that's making strategic investments she to bring down wait she times and to hold them below target. Speaker, as we uh, as we address the backlog, we have a great success story. Speaker, and uh, the volumes are allocated according to the wait time. We manage by wait times. I understand, Speaker, that different positions would have different wait times. But, Speaker, in the southwest, the wait time for cataract surgery is uh, is uh, 171 days. So. Certainly, I, this particular person could go to a different physician and get a lower wait time. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. New question, the member from Ajax Pickering. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. My constituents in Ajax Pickering tell me that every day, as the roads become more congested, they are turning to public transit. And, Minister Speaker, as a government, I'm just going to have to talk a little louder so my friends can hear. Uh, we are making record investments in public transit to make sure it's more reliable. I'm pleased that public transit has been a priority for this government. There is a distinct need to reduce gridlock and continue to improve air quality and to build stronger communities. Go Transit is a large part of this strategy. Unfortunately, I was troubled to hear recently that the Leader of the Opposition Party proposed to cancel these planned transit investments, specifically some of the BRT and that's the bus rapid transit projects in, in the big move. As a member with a BRT project currently underway, I was hoping that the minister Thank could provide you. a current status. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I want to thank the member for Ajax Pickering, who's been a particular champion for a very important project, which is the, which is the Durham Pulse project, Mr. Speaker, which is going to take st students all across Durham Region to uh, U of T Scarborough, and we're working with Roger Anderson and the folks soon to extend it to Centennial uh, College, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we actually think the 905 wants and understands transit, likes transit and LRTs, and that students at Centennial College and U of T Scarborough actually want affordable transit, and that those families shouldn't have to have three beater cars in the driveway for their kids. They can have clean supporters. Mr. Speaker, we have a problem right now, though. The official opposition is proposing to cancel most of the 15 LRT and BRT projects, Mr. Speaker. That Answer. would be catastrophic from Bombardier. It would mean a massive loss of jobs in Thunder Bay and in Barrie, where, where these parts are. It would thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Sorry, thank yes. you to my minister for the update on the Durham Pulse. It's good that we are working so closely with municipalities across Ontario to deliver this service. I know that the people in my riding of Ajax Pickering will be pleased to hear our unprecedented transit investments are working to reduce congestion in our communities. An important part of our transit strategy is also to invest in highways. It's important that we are committed to building all transportation infrastructure that is necessary and suitable to the needs of our constituents that includes investments in roads and highways. Could the minister please update the House on our investments in the highway infrastructure in my riding? Thank, thank you, you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be very happy to. And I, I want to again thank the, the really remarkable member of, for Ajax Pickering, who I refer to as Father Joe, my spiritual leader, and the, the member uh, uh, and the Minister uh, of, of Consumer Affairs, because they have delivered big time for the folks uh, that way. So you have $567.13 million for transit, Mr. Speaker, the biggest investment in transit in the history of Durham Region. We, we're proud of that record, Mr. Speaker. In addition, $329 million for highways, Mr. Speaker, including over $100 million for Highway 7 and Highway 401. Half-hour all-day go services, which is allowing the mayors along those corridors to actually see new commercial clusters and unprecedented growth in jobs along the go corridor, because they're accessible yes, now as downtown Toronto, Mr. Speaker. Plus the important extension of the 407, Mr. Speaker. This government is acting on mobility. The opposition wants to cancel it all, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from East Grenville. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, Ontarians know it was time to put the o OSPCA on a shorter leash by legislating the oversight and accountability that's non-existent today. Instead, you let them right off the leash 
with a $5.5 million windfall. OSPCA Board Chair Rob Godfrey told the Toronto Star he can't even get basic details about investigations made public. He tried, but the board shot him down. So we know the board chair himself is powerless to provide even the tiniest bit of transparency. Doesn't that prove I'm right? That, by, that it doesn't matter if you stick a ministry staffer at the end of the board table, it does nothing to have the accountability that OSPCA needs? That's what I Thank think. Thank you. Minister Safety and Corrections. Merci, Monsieur uh, le Président. I'm very proud of the work that the OSPCA is doing. And the uh, community at large is very proud also because they receive a lot of donations from the community. So with this announcement uh, last Friday, you know, we have uh, this $5.5 million that we have provided to the OSPCA will improve the uh, care of the animal in Ontario because it will establish a 24-7 centralized dispatch service to ensure, to ensure enforcement officer can respond effectively. We have created, the, they will be creating a squad of specialized trained investigators who will crack down on puppy mill and kitten mill. They will uh, be delivering specialized labs, livestock training for investigators in the agriculture sector and Thank you. in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. I'm, I'm shocked uh, you can't see the problem here. You barely finished your announcement and the OSPCA already started bragging about flexing its new muscles. You claim the new zoo registry is voluntary, yet the OSPCA that says anyone that doesn't sign up can expect a surprise knock at the door. I'd ask if uh, using a voluntary registry to target people is right, but even if you didn't like it, you can't do anything about it. Again, Minister, can you explain to Ontarians why you expanded the powers of this private police agency without putting anything in legislation that gives you any say whatsoever on how they yield their power? Thank you, Minister. With this announcement came more accountability for the OSPCA. They uh, have an agreement now with the ministry that uh, they will that stipulate that the OSPCA will produce two full reports per year for the government. We will have someone from the ministry sitting on the board of director, and they will ensure that the government will receive progress report from the OSPCA. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to take advice from that party who recently moved a motion to strip the OSPCA from the power, you know, to oversee uh, the uh, the uh, the OSPC power for animal welfare. So uh, in the on the farm, they want no OSPC to look after and to oversee what is being done in on the farm. Thank you. We voted against that. Thank you. Order. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 60, an act to strengthen consumer protection with respect to consumer agreements relating to wireless services accessed from, I'm in the middle of this, uh, from the cellular phone, smartphone, or any other similar mobile device. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would the members take their seats, please? All members, take your seats. Thank you. On October the 29th, Ms. McCharles moved third reading of Bill 60. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McCharles. Mr. 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 Mrs. Jeffries. Mrs. Jeffries. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dugood. Mr. Dugood. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Porto. Mr. Porto. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nagby. Mr. Nagby. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassa. Ms. Jassa. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Dormerla. Ms. Dormerla. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. It should be song. Should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. <laughs> Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 96 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture de projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. The members of the Senate are point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, welcome the students of Holy Trinity, Bradford, Ontario. Uh, they were here until the uh, count for the vote, uh, but I'd like all members to uh, welcome the students of uh, Holy Trinity. Thank you. The member from Windsor to come seat. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome the uncle of uh, Paige Evan uh, uh, Tanovich, who will be treating to lunch today, but his uncle, Chris Paul, has joined us uh, this morning as well. Thank you. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.